What we're going to talk a little bit about in this session is aligning, a, a much bigger concept of aligning, which is taking what you're doing in your courses, all the things you've been thinking about so far, and aligning those with the institutional learning goals. And let me take just a few minutes in this introduction to describe this for you, because most of you may not be aware of that. But several years ago, the Working Group to Improve Undergraduate Education and the University Committee on Liberal Learning identified a set of institutional learning goals that define the characteristics that we would like to see, the knowledge, attitudes, and skills that you've been talking about in all students at Michigan State University. Originally, the group had defined six goals with the work of Diane Ebert May and Nancy DeJoy, um, Kirk Kidwell, Ann Austin, Sarah Miller, a variety of people that have been in and out of here today. Those have been refined to five institutional learning goals, and each of those goals has specific dimensions or outcomes that, that further um, characterize the goal. Last year, we had about 80 faculty and staff from Iran campus that took those institutional learning goals and created rubrics for them. And you had kind of your first brief introduction to rubrics this morning in Larry's conversation. And what we're going to do this afternoon then, uh, briefly in here and then in your working group, is begin to talk to you about aligning what you're doing with those rubrics. Let me quickly tell you what the rubrics or the goals are, first of all. And as I indicated, they're very broad institutional statements of the knowledge, attitudes, and skills that we want all students at Michigan State University to achieve. Um, there are statements that we strive for across all disciplinary areas. So whether you're in here as a scientist, whether you're in here as a humanist, whether you're in here as a social scientist, these are things we hope are achieved by students across all of these disciplines. What they are not, which is maybe even more important, is number one, a set of hierarchical types of goals. They are very integrated in nature, and you will see them shortly. They do not necessarily define the specific kind of objectives that each of you is looking at in your discipline. So they are not trying to dictate what the content of disciplinary knowledge is. And there is no expectation that any one course or any one program at this university will assist students in achieving all of the outcomes or all of the goals that are there. In fact, they were designed by these groups to look at the totality of learning experiences that students have, whether they be in the courses that you're teaching or in the residence hall or through study abroad or through internships, all of those learning experiences are where students will achieve or uh, gain the competencies defined. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. There are, there are um, three presenters this afternoon. Dr. Kirk Kidwell, who is the director of the Integrative Studies in Arts and Humanities. Dr. Jeff Grable, who is the chair of Writing, Rhetoric, and American Culture. And Dr. Julie Labarkin, who is faculty in geology and associate director of the Center for Integrative Studies in the Arts and Sciences. Kirk's going to give you a brief introduction to the rubrics and the goals and some examples of how they're used in IAH. Uh, Jeff's going to continue and give you some examples of how it's being used in Tier 1 writing at Michigan State University. And then Julie's going to finish and talk to you a little bit about how these goals are being used to develop assessments in integrative studies here at MSU. So with that, Kirk, I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to start off looking at analytical thinking. Um, and this would, in a sense, this would be the stepping you through uh, the process by which you would start to think about what are the, what is the larger institutional learning goals and how do your course specific goals align with them. Um, using the language from Think, uh, the Think model yesterday, this is in a sense a part of that, um, the bottom part of his scale underneath the triangle, right? The context, the larger context. There may be um, institutional learning goals. There may also, in your programs, be specific programmatic learning goals. 
Um, and I'll show you an example of that from IEH. Um, and I think uh, Jeff and, and Julie will also be mentioning that. Um, so under analytical, we have these four different dimensions, which is what runs down the side, obviously. And we're just going to start, I'm going to show you an example of, of one. Acquires, analyzes, and evaluates information from multiple sources, which is the first one listed here, right? Um, <coughs> so you notice that there's a scale, right? A level of performance, increasing performance. Uh, and this is vastly condensed, right? Um, from emerging to developing to proficient to exemplary. Uh, and what you would then want to think about is within those characterizations of different levels of performance for that dimension of that institutional learning goal, where do you see your students in your course uh, achieving? At what level are you of, per, of student performance would you reasonably expect your students, most of them, to achieve by the end of your course? Um, so let's say that we're going to pick proficient is the level that we want uh, the students to, to achieve. Um, so this is an example of an IH course, uh, IH 231A, it's a second level IH course, um, taught by a professor in, in religious studies, Professor Gretel Van Weren, uh, on human culture, ethics, and nature. She has a course goal, an overriding course goal of what her uh, expectations are for the class in its entirety for the 15 weeks of the semester. Um, she has specific learning outcomes that the students, by the end of successful completion of the course, students will learn to one, two, three, four, right? And I'm not going to read them out there in the, the handouts that you have. Um, so then <coughs> this, you probably can't read some of the finer print, um, but uh, especially in the, in the versions that you got, um, but if we're working with the analytical thinking goal and we're focusing on primarily the first dimension here uh, <coughs> of acquires, analyzes, et cetera, what we did working with a small group of IH faculty uh, in collaboration with Nancy DeJoy is that we operationalized the institutional goals and dimensions in terms of uh, a, a core of IH courses that we're thinking about developing that we're calling for now global IEH courses that have a global theme. Um, so, the, so we have some programmatic goals. These don't really have official standing at this point. These are something that we worked on over the last semester. Um, Professor Grant Van Weeren then developed specific course-based learning outcomes for her students that based upon the institutional and programmatic goals, students who've taken my course will fill in the blank um, after taking my course. And you notice that she's got a bit of a developmental sequence going on here. Um, analyze, then interpret, then evaluate, then compare and synthesize. Again, we could, go, we could talk about this in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. We could talk about it in terms of Fink's taxonomy. Um, uh, but that it's all somewhat correlated. Again, you can see how they sequence, if you could actually read it in your handout, the programmatic goals with the dimensions, with the institutional goals. Um, so we start off with a goal, and then we identified a level of performance that we are expecting our students to achieve as a result of the participating in our course related to that specific goal dimension. Uh, we have a programmatic goal, an IH goal, compare and synthesize diverse viewpoints on the context of concrete global environmental problems. Um, so we have a, a programmatic expectation that this is aligned with. And then she has a set of assessments. And what she's going to be doing is uh, having, throughout the 15 weeks of the semester, 10 one to two page reflective essays based on the course readings and class discussions that are sequenced in such a way that they teach students how to analyze, interpret, evaluate, compare, synthesize, etc. Right. So these are formative assessments um, that are done throughout the semesters that are not only designed to measure student performance, but also to teach students how to analyze, interpret, evaluate, etc. 
right? So, um, and at the end of the semester, she has an, uh, a summative as assessment uh, in terms of, uh, if I remember right, uh, a final exam. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff to show an example from a writing course. And so I'm going to walk you through what I think is a fairly messy example from the writing program. And um, you have the advantage of having Nancy in the room with you for the rest of the afternoon. And so what I'm showing you right now is bits and pieces of a course syllabus. And I gave you a little bit more of the course syllabus in your information packet from a WRA 100 level course that was taught this spring. And so prior to Nancy's work with our writing program, so Nancy um, ran the writing program um, within my department for a number of years. And um, the big transformation that Nancy helped us achieve was the development of shared goals and learning outcomes, which was hard. Um, and in fact, it's an ongoing process. So the example I'm going to walk you through really quickly, what I want you to pay attention to is the messiness of the example. So I want you to think, as I, sh as I walk you quickly through this example, I want you to note um, not just where you see alignments between our programmatic goals and the institutional goals and course-specific goals and the programmatic goals, but also where you see lack of alignment. Because one of the things that we're, this is a process for us as a department. We teach writing to 7,000 students a year. We have a pretty big impact on the first year experience in particular. We take it seriously. We want to do a really good job. We have also 70 teaching faculty um, who, we have a lot of people in and out of those classrooms. And so this process of getting a number of very smart, independent, creative, innovative people to agree on language, agree on goals, agree on outcomes, and, and, and work through that is a little bit messy. So I think you're going to see some language um, that it doesn't align. I'm going to try and point it out to you. And I think you're going to see some misalignments as well as alignments. And I want you to see that. I didn't want to give you a very, I didn't want to give you a perfect and clean example because this process and the intellectual work that you're engaged in is actually <laughs> really difficult. So, but what you're seeing here is um, goals and outcomes for um, the course. And regardless of the 100 level course, we're now in a position in our department in which we have a shared language about goals and we have a shared language about outcomes, which makes arguing and fighting with each other uh, much more efficient. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to walk you through this, the same sort of heuristic. What I've identified as, um, as the institutional learning goal is effective communication, which is obvious. So in terms of the institutional learning goals, we work, and in your packet, I've given you the, the writing program learning goals. And you'll see that we work back and forth between the communication goals and the analytical thinking goals. But that's about it. Um, we, we tend to focus on what you would think that we would focus on in terms of institutional goals. Um, in terms of the dimensions, the things that I've um, pulled out of the goal dimensions for you to look at um, are on the table. Um, what I've given you in the next column is the first year um, selected um, language from the first year writing programs, shared goals, and then again, uh, bits and pieces from the syllabus that I, that I gave you. And I want you to see a couple of things here. I mean, if you read this very carefully, um, I actually think it's not obvious that all of this aligns perfectly because I don't think it does align perfectly. But what I do want to point out to you in terms of alignment is this notion about context and situation. So this is terribly important to the rhetorical theory that supports the way in which we teach writing. The notion that um, audiences, contexts, and situations demand different kinds of communication practices, um, skills, and expertise. This is actually very hard and terribly important. You don't write the same way in biology that you do in English. Although, and I will resist this, if you look at the way writing programs have been um, conducted largely in U.S. higher education for the last 150 years, you would think that the only writing that ever happens in the world happens in the English classroom. We know this isn't true, but this is the shared experience that most universities provide for students. So this is actually terribly important, the notion that context, situation, and audience um, really pr um, are important in terms of how students understand what effective communication is and looks like. But I think, so I think you'll see that very important alignment um, in both of the other columns, the notion of various communities, um, appropriate rhetorical purposes. Um, a, the, um, we use media, and the institutional goal is media. We've shifted it to mode. That's a misalignment. Media and mode are not the same thing. 
um, but we sort of mean them to be the same thing here. So this is another issue that we need to work on. But what we, where we do have alignment across this, across this table, at least, is this notion of situation and context is terribly important. So I think if you look at the WRA examples, again, it's like the 16th time I've said it because I'm trying to underline it with a crayon. What I want you to see are where there is alignment and where there is not alignment. And I want you to pay precise attention to language. Because as you do the work that you need to do in this situation, in this session, you need to pay a lot of attention to language because that's where all the magic happens or it doesn't. Words have meanings. It's crazy. <laughs> so I'm going to put this all up here because I'm going to walk this through. I'm going to walk you through this quickly one more time. So we've added in this example, we've added, we've added the performance layer and the assessment layer. So again, we've pulled the gold dimension out. I've pulled from the, the um, tools that you have, uh, a performance level, um, the proficiency in terms of um, communication strategies for media and various roles and contexts. Again, media and mode, various roles and contexts. Roles and contexts is meant to, um, to, meant to communicate audience situation context. Um, you can see the course goal, um, again, from that syllabus. Explore the different ways writing styles and frameworks are required in varying rhetorical spaces. Again, for me, rhetorical spaces, I can make that work in terms of context, but rhetorical space and context, not the same thing. So we've got some messiness in our own language. But then, in your packet, I've given you um, a grading rubric for the third writing project from this course. And so I wanted you to get an example of how we try and operationalize these goals in terms of a, ra a grading rubric. So I've pulled um, this um, element from the grading rubric um, for this particular 135 class. So you can get a sense of where the alignment works in terms of a goal dimension, a performance level, a course goal, and the way in which that appears in the tools that are used to assess student performance. This is the hardest problem we have to work on. Not only do we have lots of people teaching writing on this campus, they're trained in various ways. And so we have a tremendous teacher development and training problem that we have to solve every single, every single year. And one of the hardest, I work a lot with graduate students. I mentor new, t new graduate student teachers. And one of the hardest things to get them to see is that the way in which they talk about the course in the syllabus is not the same way that they talk about the course day to day. And there ought to be, they ought to be the same. And strikingly, the way in which they're assessing student performance in that class may not have anything to do with the syllabus that they've put in front of people. This is very bad, right? That's massive misalignment. And it leads to confusion and frustration on the part of students. It leads students to think things that smart students think, such as, dear professor, what do you want? Right? What do I need to do to get an A? Right. So when students are playing this very, sophistica very sophistic sophisticated game of trying to please you as a professor, um, what they're trying to do, they're, they're engaged in a form of audience analysis that they've learned um, over many years of schooling. And they've, if they're good students, they've learned to use it effectively. And they're trying to get inside your head. They're trying to figure out this from the mess that you've given them. Right? And so one of the things that we're trying to do very hard, particularly with our more novice teachers, although people like me need to learn it and relearn it all the time, is to make these kinds of alignments between goals and outcomes and this very precise and specific tools that we use for assessing student performance. There should be a bright and clear line between those things for you, and you should be able to um, demonstrate and show that bright and clear line for students as well. Does this make some sense? Does this example make some sense? It's a little messy, and I hope you see the messiness. It's not a perfect example. Um, but it's one that, 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 that was alive for the last 15 weeks in our writing program um, this past semester. So um, I'm Julie, and I'm going to talk with, I'm going to give you an example from um, Integrative Studies Physical Science course. But before I do that, I wanted to just mention that um, this work of aligning assessment and goals um, and institutional goals is something we've been doing, Kirk and Doug and I and some other people, um, to build programmatic assessments for the Integrative Studies program. So how many people here teach in ISS or IAH or ISP or ISB or ISE? Okay, all right. So if you're in those courses, you know um, that we've been doing a programmatic assessment across those courses 
to have students complete a survey to try to understand what's going on in those courses. You can go back and look at those questionnaires and you'll see that those questionnaires evolved directly from the institutional learning goals. So that's a case in which our institutional learning goals and our assessments are perfectly aligned, almost perfectly. Um, I want to show you a messier example within the context of a course. Um, it's a little bit cleaner than um, Jeff's example maybe, but maybe not as clean as Kirk's example. Um, for Integrative Studies, a physical science course. Mm -hmm. So the goal of this course is to basically introduce um, people who are not science majors to observing the world around them. So there's a world around you, and I, in fact I just talked to a colleague, I won't say who, who said that outside isn't necessarily where he goes, um, and I think of some of my students that outside is where you are when you're going from one inside to another inside. And so this course is to get people to be outside and think about the outside as a thing that's worth observing. Um, and then we have course learning goals. It's aligned with Bloom's taxonomy, so to under understand the Earth, analyze the Earth, evaluate arguments, and create new ideas or concepts about, in particular, the Red Cedar River on campus. You might have seen students down by the river with these big white poles and buckets and other things. Those are the students in this class. <coughs> so um, I wanted to do one that was maybe a little different that you might not expect for a science course. Um, I think the question of do we have to address all of these goals in our courses is a great question. And my answer would be no. And in fact, in some of my courses in the upper level, I address one of the liberal learning goals and only one dimension of those goals. It depends on what I'm aiming to do. I might have a course that's entirely on communication and that's all I'm focusing on. Um, but this is a, 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 a integrative studies course. It's more, it's broad. And in fact, effective citizenship is one of the goals of this course. Um, so we have these institutional dimensions. Um, there is a programmatic goal, um, and to step back, some of you are teaching in programs, and those programs tend to have goals. RAC has its own goals, IH has its own goals, ISGS um, uh, has its own goals, and sometimes those programmatic goals are not well aligned with institutional learning goals because they were created at different times. Right? And sometimes your course is aligned with one or not the other. And the hard work to do here is to figure out how to get all those things to fit together or to do later is to go back and actually see what are the goals of the program that I teach in. Okay. Um, so one of the goals of, of um, the Center for Integrated Studies in General Science is to help people learn to value the efforts of scientists right? and to continue to address practical needs and, and research. And that feeds back a little bit to effective citizenship but it misses this whole, there's a little piece in there that I add, the why is so you can make decisions, right, that as a citizen of the world. That's an added thing that the programmatic goals don't have in them, but it's sort of implicit to me as an instructor. Um, and then we have, again, those learning goals. So if we align um, our dimension of effective citizenship, again, wow, in a science course, um, and a sub-goal would be to be able to evaluate and analyze knowledge that allows for ethical um, reasoning about societal issues. This would be a course goal that aligns with that. So the course goal would be um, you can evaluate arguments and decisions made about the Earth's fears relative to the river on campus. And the way in which we assess whether or not we address that goal is at the end of the semester the students have to teach the MSU community by setting up tables and having a presentation, something about the Red Cedar River and impacts on the Red Cedar River, and hey, you and MSU, be nice to the Red Cedar River. Um, and the thing is, this is sort of aligned, but it's not perfectly aligned, because um, the performance level is asking for um, effective decision making. And we don't really get the students quite to effective decision making. Some of them do. Um, but many of them get to a place of being able to think about possibly in the future being effective decision makers. And that's okay. That's fine. Um, so, you've had three examples from three different places that hopefully help you see how you could align the institutional goals with your course goals. And then we hope you'll get to the assessments that you're planning or are using in your courses. Um, so I'm going to go back to what Kirk, show, or what, yeah, Kirk showed you at the beginning and lead you through what you're going to be doing for the rest of the session with your facilitators.